Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Friday, August 4th edition of the Basement Academy. As we wrap up our week together, um, I'm eager to share another reflection from uh, my time away. Uh, but first, let's begin with our morning psalm, Psalm 34. Interesting heading on this. This is a psalm of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. A scene from the life of, uh, of David. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but... The Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Mm. Psalm 34, God delivering David from a troubling situation. Taste and see that the Lord is good. <clears throat> so I want to offer a final reflection for now. And this is a reflection on art and artists and the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. Um, along the way of my trip out to Kansas City, and in Kansas City, I encountered a variety of expressions of visual art. I, I spoke on, um, on Tuesday, I think it was, yeah, on going to church, about being at St. Michael Orthodox Church in Louisville, Kentucky, where my cousin uh, Kim and her husband Denny and family uh, belong and worship. And you know, made some comment about just the the visually stimulating and arresting nature of the sanctuary. And so kind of a traditional architecture in the stance of you come in and it's a mostly square, probably rectangular room, but mostly squarish. Um, and the pews are just arranged straight and there's, you know, maybe three, 30 or 35 or 40 rows of pews, pretty, pretty large room. But what is, what is the first thing you notice, at least as an outsider to that community, is everywhere you look, there are paintings, <laughs> icons, iconography. The Orthodox Church is known for that. Paintings of the saints 
or the apostles or the holy family, mother and child, or Jesus on the cross or Mary. And there's, you know, all of them have, you know, kind of a circle, you know, the halo. I'm sure everyone's seen icons in some way, stained glass windows where the figures are, you know, they're not realistic. You know, they're kind of thin and long, right? And a lot of times the hand is held up in some gesture and there might be something in the other hand that would give some indication of, you know, uh, who, who that saint or apostle or uh, individual is. And so, you know, I, I talked about the liturgy was mostly unfamiliar to me. There was an echo of familiarity. I'd hear some phrases uh, that I would know. But I was doing a lot of this during the service. I'm just looking around. And I talked about how immersive the service was. You know, at first it was kind of odd and unfamiliar, but as the time went on, again, it was nearly two hours long. I, I, something happened about halfway through and I realized, oh, and then I, it occurred to me what I'm looking at this, this dome. Uh, and so the, 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 I think it was the 12 apostles, uh, maybe Paul was in there because Judas was not, I didn't see all of them. But, but there's this dome and then a chandelier hanging. And even on the chandelier were just little, I, I'm guessing they were maybe six by six, you know, the, it was far away, were little icons of, I assume, other saints in the, in the Orthodox tradition everywhere. And it struck me, oh, <laughs> coming into this place for worship reminds us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, uh, what the book of Hebrews reminds us of. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run our race with perseverance, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so there's a visual reminder in these artistic expressions, in the icons, of the reality, the spiritual reality, we are not the only ones who follow Jesus. The faith didn't begin and it won't end with us. We're entering into something that has been before. And so it, it's, this, it's this reality of art employed in the service of the faith, of teaching the faith, of carrying the faith, of depicting the faith. Now, I know some believe that iconography is a violation of the commandment against graven images. Make no graven image of, so do not depict the living creature because the tendency would be to worship the thing you've made rather than the creator. Right, so don't worship the creature, worship the creator. So I, I, I recognize, I know that Protestant <clears throat> uh, warning that, that is uh, often issued. But so I was, I was just, I was uh, drawn in uh, by it all. So I'll, I'll say it that way. And so that was kind of the first encounter along this way. And that was day three or four of my, uh, of my journey. I uh, got to Kansas City day later, uh, actually later that day, but uh, the following day on early, I think it was July 3rd, maybe, I went out for a walk and kind of catty corner to where our daughter lives is a park, Meadowbrook Park, that is essentially a repurposed plot of land. It was a farm. It became a golf course. <laughs> and then, and now it is a public park. And Johnson County, uh, Kansas, uh, Johnson County has a public art program, which is really cool. And I'll talk about that in a second. But this Meadowbrook Park, it, it's so imagine a golf course, okay? So a, a significant portion of that golf course, not the full course, but a significant portion, my guess it would be probably four or five holes worth of land. Uh, uh, walking trails. Um, I think I counted four separate 
playgrounds for kids to play on. You know, and some of them were elaborate climbing structures, ropes, uh, you know, low, but, but, you know, like balance beam kind of things. Um, colorful, um, creative in the movements that they would ask of the child, I think, um, and to, to stimulate their imagination. There were some fitness stations along the way. There was a music lab. One little area had, I think, about six or seven different instruments, a little mallet, like a, like kind of like a marimba and then like a vibraphone and different tubes that you would slap the thing and different length tubes. And so you would hear different sounds so that children and adults, <laughs> I went and played Amazing Grace and, and, and recorded that, <laughs> um, that it would stimulate the imagination, the, the physical structure, understanding how length and diameter of tubes and, and width of little metal or wood slats creates different sounds. And so it was a music lab. Wow, how cool is this thing? And then of course, over in the corner were the pickleball courts <laughs> that were very full. And so, um, and then there was, it would stretch over and there was a little pond that you would walk around. It was wonderful, just wonderful, loved it. So a couple days went, went for walks over in the, in the park. And I mentioned this, this public arts uh, program of Johnson County. And so there was this one particular portion of the park devoted to it. So it was a giant sunflower that was probably, well, the diameter would have been, I think over six feet because you could walk through it. And so it's, you know, coming out of the ground it's got the, the, the yellow leaves in the center where the seeds would be, you know, the, the, the face of it. You could walk through that. And then once on the inside, you would turn and there was about a, you might say maybe 18 inch wide that would, you know, it went up and around kind of the inner part of the ring. There was um, golly, it, it, like a panel essentially. And, and etched into that panel was a history of Johnson County. Native Americans, farmers, city development. And so fascinating. So this sunflower, the state flower of Kansas. And so this wonderful, and then a description of the public art program of um, Johnson County. And sure enough, I began to notice as I'm driving around just, you know, on a corner of a street in kind of a residential area would be a sculpture. And then in another part where there might be a little bit of a strip mall, there would be a sculpture. <laughs> and it's like, oh, this is so cool that Johnson County has this awareness of the importance of the, the visual arts. And so, um, Photography, think of the visual arts, painting, sculpture, um, photography, um, architecture, right? So architecture itself is, is a visual art. What is it? I go, you know, why, why would a county devote resources and land, you know, money and land and time, obviously, because you commission art. So you're paying an artist for their time. And so all dotted around the county, I assume, you know, I just saw a portion of it, were these expressions of public art. Why would you devote valuable real estate, valuable time, valuable money to these one-off sculptures? What's the point? What is the point of art and particularly public art? The artists are those who are image bearers of God. Remember, just because somebody may or may not, maybe, you know, as Christians, we think of ourselves as image bearers. Well, guess what? Every human being bears the image of God. Every human being is made in God's image, not just Christians. So I, I don't know anything about the artists who, who, who created these, these works. 
but they were captured by a calling, <laughs> a vision of beauty. Uh, they sensed their life purpose was to create. And it started as a child, probably painting something in kindergarten. Mommy, mommy, look what I made. It goes up on the refrigerator. Like we all did as children, like we all do as parents, we put up our kids' art on the refrigerator for a while, right? And so the artists have the vision. They have the understanding that there is beauty in the world. There is transcendence and there they need to call forth <laughs> beauty. They're captured with the sense. And so whether it's in flowing curves or, or angular, whether it's realism or um, surrealism, you know, the, the artists have a, a vision and art ennobles the human spirit, doesn't it? it? It points to the fact and the reality that there is something beyond us. It elevates us. It, it, it motivates us. There's more to life than money and work and tasks and function. That it's important to spend time. It is worth it to spend money, to give one's life to the creating of art. There's meaning and purpose and ideals that we need to be reminded of. So in the same way as I'm in the sanctuary at St. Michael Orthodox, surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, these works of public art remind me gently that there is beauty in the world. Oh yeah, more than just going to the grocery store to get my groceries and get on with my life. I pause, I notice, I wonder, what is this? What was the artist trying to capture here about the world or humanity or their own soul that they're giving expression to. And that stopping and pausing and wondering and reflecting is itself an activity that is, I was say important to do, necessary uh, to do, I would say. That the final reflection then would be on the final Sunday of our time in Kansas City, uh, we took uh, a little trip to the Nelson Atkins Museum, downtown Kansas City. We've been there uh, the second time now we've been there. Wonderful collection, um, sculpture, you know, throughout the history of humanity, ancient Egyptian sculptures and figures and sarcophagus and a mummy. I saw a mummy. Oh my gosh, that was kind of funny. Um, you know, the great Dutch and Flemish. I did, We didn't get to all of the, um, all of the exhibits. Uh, you can only spend so much time there. Uh, I saw the head of John the Baptist on a platter. I saw the prodigal son leaving home. And I, I've seen other expressions of the prodigal son here. The mother was clutching him. And I'd never seen that. We never think, we think about the father, right? The prodigal father, uh, the father of the prodigal, who then runs to meet his son and prepares the fatted calf. The text, the scripture is silent about mom, but the artist captured a mother clinging to her son as he sets his face to leave. Oh my gosh, what a great piece that, that was. And then uh, there were four uh, Rembrandts there. Uh, I sat in or stood in front of one for, you know, maybe three or four minutes. Um, young man in black beret. And just a young man with a kind of a wispy little mustache and a black beret, and that's it. And after about a minute or two, something happened. I go, oh. I, I called my son Colson. I said, Colson, Rembrandt touched this painting. And Colson kind of like, uh, yeah, Dad, he painted it. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. We... I, I can't touch it. <laughs> They'll throw me out <laughs> if I touch it. But this painting is like a portal. It's like a living link. We're just separated by, did the math, kind of 360 years. Is that what that would be? 360 years ago, Rembrandt, the great artist, stood in front of this painting and he observed it and made another stroke, another stroke, and he touched this. We're in front of something he has touched. Dude, do you realize what this means? And he's like, okay, yeah. 
This is true of all these works of art, going back to the ancient Egyptian from the 3000 BC or whatever, you know, these different um, uh, ancient Mesopotamian and Egyptian sculptures. And I realize this is in kind of like the incarnation. It's an embodied moment. This, this physical object, this painting or this sculpture It is a link to a world that happened before me. And it's a link to beauty and transcendence and meaning and purpose and vision and a noble spirit. <laughs> and I thought of the incarnation, the word made flesh, something about Jesus becoming flesh. Oh, God isn't just out there somewhere isn't just a transcendent ideal. God became human flesh. And then I started thinking about communion and the bread that we break and the bread that we take and eat is the bread that Jesus held in the same way that painting is a, is a Rembrandt held this painting. Jesus held this bread. You say, well, no, technically Jesus didn't hold that bread. You know, Susan Boyd made the bread from flour and water and yeast and, you know, I go, yeah. but this is what art does. This is what the physical reality does. It, 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 it engages the imagination, right? Jesus held this bread. This is my body, which is broken for you. We hear the words of institution every Sunday, uh, this Sunday as we will take communion. This is the bread that Jesus took and broke and gave to his disciples. And then his disciples held that bread. After Jesus had ascended to the Father, the disciples took the bread and broke it and gave it to the people gathered. And the people gathered and so on down to us at Greenwich. And so I didn't expect this little encounter with art and artists <laughs> Uh, and the icons and the saints and the great cloud of witnesses. And so I realized the Nelson Atkins Museum itself is a cloud of witnesses to beauty and the beautiful God, even though the artists, many of them I'm sure did not know God through Jesus Christ. But everything in creation bears witness to the creator. Every image bearer bears witness to the creator. And so there's this, this notion of what it means to bear the image of God. And many will say, the philosophers say reason. And others will say speech. And others will say love, the capacity for love. And others will say uh, it's our tool making that, that humans, we make tools and we build. And there's another vein of thought that says, we most reflect the image of God when we create. Because he is a creator. <laughs> And so this reflection on art and the artists, the, the icons of St. Michael Church and, and the public art of Johnson County and the witness of the Nelson Atkins Museum and that Rembrandt uh, bear witness to this beautiful creative God that we know and love and serve in whose image we are made. So let me encourage you to visit an art gallery. Let me visit you to, incur, to, to visit the Greenwich Gallery. I want to give a shout out to Glenn Howell. Uh, thank you, Glenn, for your vision and your commitment to be the curator, the organizer of the Greenwich Gallery. Thankful for the building committee all those years ago. Let's not have a lobby that just has bulletin boards and announcements on pieces of paper that are curled and you know outdated. Let's have a gallery. To, to celebrate the visual arts. And so let me invite you to stop and, 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 and enjoy the Greenwich Gallery this Sunday uh, and, and notice throughout the year that we'll rotate that. So Glenn, thank you. And may we continue to have this vision at Greenwich of, of the beauty uh, of God and, and of the people of God who create uh, such beautiful works. Let, let, let's close the prayer. Father, thank you uh, for the gifts of uh, our our artists, who they are and what they create, those contemporary artists, those among us at Greenwich, 
those who've come before, those who've created the icons at St. Michael's and other churches and uh, in public art expressions in Johnson County and other places and all the galleries that we can visit. Oh, so, Father, bless us with this vision of your beauty, your transcendence, the meaning and purpose that comes to our life that you call us to. And we thank you for the incarnational reality of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the bread and the cup that we will lift this weekend and that we will celebrate and remember that we are your children. We are your people, even the body of Christ joined together, gathered with saints, the great cloud of witnesses who've gone before and those who will come after. And so, Father, lift our spirits as we offer our prayers now in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God grant you this day and every day a vision of his beauty through the beauty of creation and the beauty of those who create with the elements of God's creation. Bless you this day and forevermore. Amen.